this week. How all vehicles are on the road are close to being hackable. Maybe they already are. Misinformation on the internet, no way. Jersey police are barred from using Clearview. Uh, CDC reports on coronavirus. I had to throw that in. And Colbert reports said that ransomware payments increased a lot last year in the last quarter. Uh, in the expert commentary, welcome Jason Wood, as ever, of Paladin Security. He's going to talk about leaked documents exposed a secretive market for your web browsing data. So stay tuned for this episode of Security Weekly News. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. Make sure your team is prepared to fight off the latest cybersecurity threat. IT Pro TV is the resource to keep you and your IT team skills up to date. You can stream IT Pro TV courses live and on demand, so there's no need to send staff to off-site training. Team subscriptions include Pro Portal, so managers have full control over your team's training schedule. Go to itpro.tv slash hack naked and use the code HN30 to try it free for seven days and receive 30% off your monthly membership. As technology continues to evolve and expand, so have the countless ways our critical systems can be put in jeopardy. Ransomware attacks, misconfiguration, user error, and malicious threat actors, to name a few. As IT infrastructures continue to grow and diversify, how do you ensure stable security? Core Security, a help systems company, provides an analytics-driven, layered approach to security with a portfolio that enables both proactive and reactive responses. With Core Security, you can reduce risk by limiting access, detect upcoming and active threats, test for security weaknesses, and efficiently monitor data for actionable insights. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com forward slash core security. Welcome to the news for the week of 26 January 2020. I am your host, Doug White. Uh, our next webcast is February 13th with Sri Sundaralingam, uh, Vice President Product and Solutions Marketing at ExtraHop, where we will discuss cloud native network detection and response. Register for all our upcoming webcasts cast by using securityweekly.com and selecting the webcast drop down from the top menu bar and clicking registration. So let's get to the news this week. So the big three automakers in the United States now, according to this report, only sell connected cars. So that means pretty much any modern vehicle in the last few years has some sort of either local, like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, hotspot kind of things and or all the above cellular types of connections that are allowing it to either connect to you connect to your your equipment that's in the vehicle and or connect to back at the factory so all these things rolling off the line now with cellular service are built into the price of the vehicle so that means you're connected and it may actually get to the point where you have to be connected or the vehicle's not going to work i know my vehicle doesn't have to be connected but when you disconnect it it gets very unhappy because it's constantly reporting in back to somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, pretty scary if you look at it. Upstream Security reported that in 2020, the majority of vehicles sold in the United States will be connected directly to the internet. In 2019, they reported 176 known attacks. So this was ones that were reported that somebody actually was able to identify uh, against vehicles. And so I'm guessing that's a much bigger number if you really dig into it. Uh, this stuff ranges from people that are just basically, again, credential stuffing or gathering credentials um, to the manipulation of the vehicles via compromises in the main server. So, and that and that kind of compromise actually went everywhere from individual vehicles being targeted uh, when they were driving on the freeway to actually attacking multiple vehicles at the same time by compromising these back office servers, some of which actually can cause a vehicle to stop, shut down, do all kinds of things. So at this point, uh, I think this is likely to represent a large issue over the next few years because you're going to see more of this, more vehicles that are on the road that are going to be interconnected somehow. So, you know, you may want to look into that when you're buying vehicles that are, say, anything less than five years old. Uh, misinformation on the internet, say it ain't so. I, I, I mean, come on, Facebook, Google, Twitter. 
misinformation on your on no way but yes so facebook google and twitter this week uh, announced that they are trying harder to control disinformation and misinformation in particular about the coronavirus out, outbreak in fact the no, novel coronavirus outbreak that started in wuhan china um one of the posts that Facebook was particularly pointing out was a, was a really old post that says oregano, oregano oil proves effective against coronavirus. Apparently this is an old, old meme that's been around a long time that was probably started by, I don't know, like the or, oregano oil manufacturers association or something. But this post was shared over 2,000 times across multiple groups just like over the weekend. So Facebook had stepped in to try and, and tweak up their algorithm for this to try and step down health risks that result and, uh, with Google and uh, Twitter joining into this. Uh, basically, the way they're doing this is they have algorithms that detect fast-moving stories that are false, and then they start downranking them to try to get them out of search results and so forth. I don't know if that works. They obviously don't know if that works either. Uh, they may go ahead and post warnings on the post that it is false. I haven't seen that personally myself, and I've seen plenty of uh, false reports. And remember, this whole thing was focused just on health care issues. There's plenty of other misinformation and disinformation. This kind of story is probably going to show up a lot this year because the presidential election gets going. There's going to be a lot of discussion about misinformation, disinformation on all of these social media platforms. So, you know, Kim Trails, anyone? In a follow-on to the Clearview facial recognition app, controversy last week. Uh, this week, New Jersey became the first state to bar police from using the Clearview facial recognition app. The governor's office uh, not only uh, barred the police from using it, they actually sent a cease and desist letter to Clearview because apparently Clearview was using an image of the governor of uh, New Jersey to promote their application. Um, uh, Clearview also had a claim in one of their ads that the NYPD was using the app and they'd apparently thwarted some sort of an attack, but NYPD denied this. On the same vein, uh, London Metro Police went the opposite direction and said that the London Metro Police would be using facial recognition widely to spot criminals on video cameras, which are just about everywhere in London, if you've been there lately. Of course, they're just about everywhere, everywhere these days. Uh, this reproach, which was described as China-esque, uh, is a first in Western Europe, but it's very likely not going to be the last. Uh, Metro Police didn't indicate what kind of software they're using, but, uh, but the New York Times put out a study that more than 600 law enforcement agencies are currently using Clearview for this. At the same time, uh, uh, Twitter went after Clearview and sent them a cease and desist letter basically stating that their app was violating Twitter policies by scraping photos and information off of Twitter and demanded that Clearview stop taking photos and data from the social media website for any reason. And, you know, I, a lot of this sort of started against Clearview when they started bragging and running ads talking about how they'd scraped 3 billion photos and tags and all this kind of stuff and that they were handing them all over to law enforcement. So who knows in the back office what's going on with all that stuff. But, you know, it's always something in that regard. Um, also this week, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo warned that the United Kingdom's sovereignty, I mean, not, not just like the United Kingdom's, you know, budget or something, but their, act, their very sovereignty would be in jeopardy if they allowed Huawei to develop the UK's 5G infrastructure. The UK is in the final stages of awarding contracts to the service for the networks for 5G across the United Kingdom, and Huawei is considered a front runner in that. The head of MI5, which is British intelligence, had actually said previously that there was no reason to think that Huawei tech would threaten British intelligence uh, sharing with the United States, but the U.S. did not agree with that. Huawei, of course, has said that their products are not used for spying and cannot be used for spying. Of course, we've all heard those, those stories before. I mean, you know, that's what everybody always says, but, you know, who knows? Clearview probably says their product can't be used for bad deeds either, but, you know, they, they say that stuff anyway. 
And I couldn't resist but throwing this in, even though it's not really a security issue, but it does affect a lot of us who do travel. Uh, in China, in the China news, uh, the United States Department of State issued a level three travel advisory uh, yesterday on travel to all of China. So not just certain parts, but to all of China. Um, this was because of, I'm sure you've seen this headline by now, a novel co uh, coronavirus in Wuhan, uh, Hubei province. A level three advisory, of course, from the State Department is, if you don't have to go, I wouldn't, uh, kind of warning to everyone. So probably if you need to be going to China, it's probably not a good idea. Mostly this is not so much due to the deadliness of the coronavirus, although it is a serious health threat, according to the CDC and others. But basically, the Chinese government keeps stepping into towns where the coronavirus shows up, and they lock them down and quarantine them. So if you end up there, you may end up getting, you know, you may get to stay there for quite some time. Uh, they're already saying that they may not re release quarantines in some parts until the 10th of February at the earliest. Uh, Hubei province uh, is actually a level four advisory from the State Department, which is a do not travel warning. Uh, meaning, you know, and you can't get there anyway. So if you're planning to go to, to Wuhan uh, anytime soon or to take a cruise down the Yangtze River, uh, you're probably not going to be able to do that because those areas are all closed by the Chinese police and military, so they're not going to let you in. Uh, the CDC does, to avoid misinformation, uh, the CDC does have a full report on the novel coronavirus. I put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, the symptoms are fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Uh, wash your hands and, and don't go to work sick, please, because I don't want to get this either. And I would probably skip any trips to China in the near future. But, you know, don't panic either. So read the CDC report if you start panicking or you start seeing crazy stories about stuff. Um, Cisco this week documented a vulnerability in WebEx meeting suite, which allows unauthenticated remote users to access meetings via iOS or Android devices without providing a meeting password. Uh, the vulnerability was published on the 24th and says that unauthorized attendees should appear in the meeting list as a mobile attendee that's unidentified otherwise. So if you've got mobile attendees in your meetings, you might want to check that out. Uh, CVE 2023142, it's in the show notes if you want to get to it, uh, basically reports on this uh, pretty significant vulnerability to your Cisco WebEx meetings, uh, which a lot of people are using. Uh, so far, there there is no uh, there was no work around to that. Um, Intel did finally announce the third patch addressing Zombie Load Two. Zombie Load Two is, is a fairly uh, sophisticated kind of problem, but it does allow access to sensitive data inside the processor, and it affects pretty much all the processors produced since 2011. So. In that secure space in the processor, uh, you can obviously go read up on Zombieland 2 if you want to read up on all the grim details. But passwords, keys, you name it, it can be in that secured, supposedly secured area of the processor. We reported on this vulnerability before. CVE 2020-0548, again, I put in the show notes. But it's not very easy for the conditions to occur that you would actually be exposed to this exploit, according to Intel, Unless, of course, they do, in which case you got a big problem. And it wouldn't be a week without ransomware. Uh, a Covare report that came out this week uh, basically said that ransomware, wait for it, payments increased by over 100% in quarter four of 2019, with the average payment now up to 84000 roughly, dollars on large enterprises that were being attacked by Riot and Sod Sodinic. So Dena Kibi, I, I love Riot because I can say it, and I hate Sodena Kibi because it's so hard to say. But uh, primarily the, the response is, even though overall ransomware attacks were down in 2019 by about 6%, um, basically because these are becoming more coordinated, targeted, and deeper attacks, the ransoms were going up at the same time. Um, Small attacks also had gone up uh, due to the, the service-oriented approach by things like Dharma, which have de average demands around $1,500. They went on in, re in the report and said that 98% of the victims that paid were actually getting working decryption tools. I'm not exactly sure they I guess it's self-reported data. Um, the report st stated that the average attack lasted 16.2 days until they were fully back up and running. And you think about all the stories that you read this year 
Um, this is just stuff that was reported, so there's plenty of stuff out there that wasn't. So ransomware remains one of the scariest things out there on the horizon as far as I'm concerned. At the same time, Reuters said that U.S. insurers have increased insurance rates for cyber insurance by up to 25% as a result of these more expensive ransomware attacks. Um, even though there was a decline in ransomware in 2019, uh, this stuff's been hitting harder. It's been causing you to pay more and be more desperate to pay. So the policies often do cover ransoms, but insurers now like Zurich AG are more likely to write policies uh, if you have security features in place in your enterprise, you're seeing more movement down that road toward requirements by underwriters that you have security, uh, good security hygiene, that you have certain security practices in place. So I think over the next five to 10 years, you're going to see more insurance policies requiring that you have certain specific things available. Sampo International is also trying, uh, I know they, they reported they were trying to identify features that indicated that you were particularly vulnerable to ransomware. So all this is really starting, I think, to move toward a more traditional risk versus return, risk versus premium kind of model that insurance companies use for almost everything else. So if you have a lot of accidents, if you have a lot of uh, speeding violations, uh, you pay a lot higher premium than somebody who is a safe driver. So you're probably going to see more movement of that in cyber insurance. NIST published draft guidelines yesterday providing their recommendations for defending against ransomware attacks. Uh, two draft guidelines were made available. Uh, they're, they're open for comment. I put the link to those guidelines in the show notes. Um, finally, in that area, I literally know almost nothing about sports, but as we enter the Super Bowl season, there was an announcement that uh, numerous NFL teams' Twitter accounts, okay, well, somebody ha hacked a Twitter account, uh, but a group called Our Mind, which is a hacktivist-oriented uh, group, uh, hacked several NFL teams' Twitter, posted notices basically saying that they were back and they wanted to show everybody that everything is hackable and put up a link to a website which provides security services. So uh, our mind claimed in the interview they had hacked uh, all the NFL Twitter accounts and they were just targeting a few for now. <coughs> and with that, we'll take a short break and be back with expert commentary and deep thoughts of Jason Wood. Stick around. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome back. And we have now Jason Wood, who's going to give us some exciting commentary. And Jason, thanks for being here today. As always, good to be here. Uh, this article that we're talking about, or bit of news, goes into the why am I not really that surprised by this? <laughs> Uh, category of news, but you may you may not have heard of this before, and uh, and this report I thought was was still interesting to read through. Uh, this was a collaborative effort by Motherboard and PC Mag to investigate a vast antivirus uh, and their data collection, and more interestingly, the resell of that data uh, that again folks may not have known of. So the basic idea is this. Avast uses its antivirus software to collect information about your web views, or the user's uh, web browsing habits. What search terms are they using? What clicks, links are they clicking on? And even some reports about things that are going into shopping carts um, in one site and actually being purchased in another site. They uh, gather all of this up. They claim that they de-identify the data and then resell it via another a subsidiary that they have. Uh, to companies that can use this data for their own needs. Presumably, marketing would be the highest on the list here uh, of potential interest by the, the customers. Uh, now, there are a number of issues, to me at least, with what's going on here. But the basic issue is, of course, that users have little to no idea of what is being collected or why and what's being done with it. 
Avast reports in their marketing materials, they have 435 million active users per month. And their subsidiary, JumpShot, which actually resells the data, uh, claims that they have data from 100 million different devices. Now, the data collected by Avast is opt-in. You, it, it, it gets authorized, and it, I'm sure you can picture where this is occurring. You go to do the install, and they have this little checkbox and a one-liner that says, hey, by the way, you know, we collect some diagnostic and non-personal information that can't, you can't be identified. Uh, you know, leave this enabled or click on this to opt in. But uh, you know, if you select next and go past that with that checkbox check, you have likely opted into this program. Um, now, without fail, whenever I see these opt-ins in all kinds of applications, uh, the description of what's going on is very vague, and there's always a promise that they're not going to identify me in the data that they collect. They, nobody will be able to trace back whatever they find back to me. And I've always been rather wary of these promises and you know the, the vague nature of what they are collecting. And in this case, this is one of the reasons why I get very uh, suspicious about these types of programs. In the case of Avast, uh, the data collected, like I said, includes your search terms, links clicked, even actions taken on individual web pages. Avast claims they do not collect any information about the user themselves, though you could argue all of the stuff we're searching for does essentially describe ourselves a little bit here. Um, but it's actually tied back to some kind of device ID that is unique to the software install. And the only way to change that device ID is basically to uninstall the software, reinstall it. The data is sent over to JumpShot where it gets packaged up for resale in various services. And the data, again, like I said, is presumably of interest to marketing teams uh, by their JumpShot's customers. The link in the show notes goes back to the original article by Motherboard. Uh, several of the customers that they list there uh, are, or are listed there, and some of them are rather ironic, uh, one of them being Google, which I thought was kind of funny, is why does Google need to buy information about people's search terms and things they're clicking and where they're going on the Internet, since that's pretty ubiquitous as it is. Uh, there are several things that they were mentioned in this article that do seem rather questionable to me. Not necessarily meaning that they're illegal, just they have asked us playing games here with it to keep their data collection going. Initially, a lot of this data was coming from plugins or extensions that were being added to browsers. So you install software, they prompt you to install their browser extension as part of that, and presumably this will protect you from going to malicious websites and stuff like that, and they'll, they'll look up these sites against their database of, of naughty places to be. And um, Mozilla and Opera found out, though, about the data being collected and how it was being used and shut them down. They, they pulled the extensions. So Vast decided to step back from the browser extension module model and has actually decided to build this into the core antivirus product. So as soon as you install the AV, this is what you get. You get this kind of monitoring and data collection occurring on everything that you're doing inside of your system. and uh, you know, AV has some really deep access into systems, so you know they can they can monitor a ton of stuff, and that gets a little bit concerning when you get into resale of data like this. Um, seems like their way of doing this is you know kind of an acknowledgement on their part, maybe that you know, folks aren't going to be really pleased with this. Maybe it's a little dodgy, uh, but they you know now they're keeping it more in their control by having it in the core engine. Um, and then just the whole idea of this seems to be rather questionable to me. We're a vast service that they're offering is a product that is supposed to protect you and help you keep your your uh, system secure, and yet then they turn around and collect data about you and sell it to somebody else. Uh, I doubt anybody who installs Avast goes into it with the idea of saying, hey, I'm really looking forward to having my data being resold, probably thinking about protecting against viruses, spyware, things like that, which this is a massive bit of spyware. Um, it is possible that you know Avast decided to go this route to get some revenue out of their free uh, tier of antivirus, but even still not very 
uh, comfortable for me. What finally, one of the thing that was noted in this article is there are concerns about how anonymous this data really is. Mm. And I'm going to butcher this name, but I'm going to try it anyhow. Uh, Gunez, Gunez Akar, a researcher who works at a university group that studies large scale internet monitoring, uh, states that d- data identification, data de identification is an error prone process. And it can eventually be pointed back to the person that was supposedly unidentifiable. The car states, and I quote, most of the threats posed by de- uh, de-anonymization, where you are identifying the people, comes from the ability to merge the information with other data, end quote. So even if you are anonymized in one data set when combined with another data set that organizations can buy, such as or have access to, such as like Google, uh, you can end up being unmasked anyhow and, and be identified that way. One of the things that, that is frustrating about this, there's not much that we as individuals can do to protect ourselves against this type of activity other than not installing the app and like every app out there is trying to get data from us. So that's pretty difficult. We can go ahead and notify lawmakers and regulatory uh, organizations uh, some of the lawmakers quoted in here is being concerned about some of this this activity. We can let other people know about it so that they are at least aware of what they're opting into and try to opt out, making sure that we are not sending unnecessary data to companies uh, like this. Such so, so don't opt in to that type of monitoring and data collection. Um, Governments and businesses all have an interest in what we're doing online, uh, either because they want to make money off of what we're doing or better tailor their their advertising services mm-hmm. to us, or because governments are concerned that maybe we're up to something that we that's against the law or that they don't like. Uh, in either way, it's really kind of an illustration how easy it is to fall into a massive data tracking uh trap, if you will, without even really realizing you have done so. Uh, If this concerns you, then you need to take a look again at those opt-in settings and potentially even the entire application or applications that you're using. Uh, At least it won't provide complete protection, but at least provide us with some avoidance of this type of uh, collection. All right. Uh, I, I will note that Avast has its own browser that it's constantly trying to run as well. So when you install Avast, if the the not the free version, but you actually the pay version, it continually tries to set your default browser to their secure browser, which of course is also under that opt-in. Uh, the other warning I'll give you about opt-ins: be careful with products that update constantly, because a lot of times when they update, you know, you opted out or you didn't opt in, which usually means you had to opt out uh, when you installed it the first time and then they do an update every, you know, three days. And every time they up, I'm not saying that Avast does this, but, but I have seen this, uh, every time they do an update, there's another opt out that you have to click. And I've seen other products that constantly bother you if you have not opted in saying, wouldn't you like to opt in? Come on. And, and after a while you get frustrated with it and then you either forget to do it and, or you, you opt in. So if you're worried about that kind of stuff, Be sure and check those opt-out, like Jason said. Thank you, Jason, for filling us in on that. I'll go home and uninstall a vast now. So uh, uh, (laughs) and that made my day. Uh, Finally, uh, apparently, along with impossible beef, uh, well, now there is impossible pork. I know this doesn't have anything to do with security, but it just sounded interesting. Um, I have tried impossible beef, and I thought it was actually very good. Uh, So now, hopefully, soon we'll be able to get impossible bacon-wrapped impossible pork sandwiches. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Security Weekly News. Tune in Friday at 12 o'clock EST for a Security Weekly News Wrap-Up. And check out all the other content we've got this week. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time.